I want to thank everyone for joining me for this Beth Israel members event. And one of the reasons we kept it to members is because I know that uh, there are a lot of ways to get information on this topic. And I want, wanted to provide a way for our members to engage with a friend of the congregation. We have many, many brilliant people in the congregation and who are friends of the congregation to help us understand complex issues. And I'm glad to be able to call upon Matthew Shugart once again. It's my honor to, on such momentous events happening all around us, to introduce Professor Matthew Shugart. All right, thank you. Uh, I, and I have to ask the obligatory, can you hear me okay? Yes, we do. And, and, and okay, if you start to fade, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, well, I, uh, I am a retired now professor of political science. And for many years, I was at UC San Diego, which is how Rob Nadav and I have a, have a connection. And um, for the last 10 years, I've been at UC Davis, although, like I said, I retired in 2013. My specialty is comparative democracy, dem particularly, uh, let's say, democratic institutions, like the, the structure or the kind of the, the, the bones of democracy. <laughs> uh, and I, since I happen to keep them always within my reach, I mean, so one of my books, this is from 2000, I don't even remember, 2014, um, A Different Democracy. We have we 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 compare the the different democracy reference here is the U.S. Anyway, the the book is about how unusual the U.S. is in comparative perspective, and one of the cases we we use is Israel. I I wouldn't call myself an expert on Israeli politics, but I'm a uh, oh wow. I'm I'm honored. Rob Mickey says I've taught that book. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I wouldn't call myself an expert on Israeli politics per se. I, I would call myself an, uh, an, an expert on political institutions. And, and, but Israel is one of the countries I follow most closely for personal interest. But I've also published, I, I, maybe I'm being too modest, I've published several things on Israeli politics. I've got the chapter on the electoral system in the Oxford Handbook of Israeli Politics and Society. So that's kind of a big thing. And I, I taught uh, Israeli politics at UC Davis several times over the last several years. So that's where I'm coming from. And so uh, rather than talking any more about myself, you see, I always blush a bit when I talk about myself and or when people tell me that uh, they're using my books. So I do, you know, I try to stay a little bit modest about these things. But here we go. I'm going to tell you what I think is going on, how it compares, and try to situate it in uh, like the perspective of the last several years of trends in Israeli party politics. So to start with is, I just you know, want to describe the goals of the reform or the, the judicial overhaul as it's often being called. Um, I'm sure mo and anyone who's tuning in here knows you know, basically what's going on, but just so that we're on the same page, so to speak. Give the, the, one of the most important aspects of it is to give the Knesset majority and therefore the coalition government control over appointments to the Supreme Court and other uh, other other courts in the Israeli judicial system to require uh, that's one thing to require a supermajority of the Supreme Court to declare any legislative act contrary to the Constitution of Israel and to allow a Knesset majority, 61 of the 120 member, elected members of the Knesset to um, override Supreme Court declarations. So that's three pillars, appointments, um, right to declare legislative acts as un invalid and right to override from the right up to the legislature to override any such declarations that they nonetheless still declare. So of course, this is, this prompted mass demonstrations. I mean, on a truly vast scale, um, not only by Israeli standards, but I, but I, perhaps, no democracy has experienced protests on this larger scale. The only rival I can think of is is, and I'm not an expert on protests, but I've consulted with a few people, and it seems like the only one that's a clear rival was South Korea had some huge protests over corrupt over attempting to get and successfully getting a president impeached in 2016-17. Something like three to 5% of the Israeli population has been on the streets at any one time. Um, 
which is actually really huge. And a U.S. equivalent would be like over 8 million people. Can you imagine 8 million Americans being out in the streets at any one time protesting something, I, so, some act of the government? I, I No, I can't. <clears throat> so what's the context in which all this is happening? Need to, I need to act like a political science professor for a moment. Okay, for several moments. That's what I am, right? So um, talk a little bit about Israeli political institutions. So it's a parliamentary democracy with a with a with a single uh, chamber, no upper house. Um, that chamber is elected by proportional representation. It's a unitary system, meaning there are no regional governments like state governments or provincial governments. Um, so by parliamentary, of course, we mean the head of government and cabinet rests on the legislative majority, and um, by proportional representation, we simply mean that the legislature is elected to ensure that party, each political party has a share of seats that's about equal to its share of the votes. The pre there's a president, totally ceremonial. Uh, Isaac Herzog has attempted to mediate in this and is still attempting to mediate. He has no authority to enforce anything or to veto anything. Um, this is not an unusual combination, parliamentary, Proportional representation, unicameral, there are lots of democracies that have this combination or something very similar to it. Israel's is a bit extreme in ways I'll get to, but it's not rare. <clears throat> and many political scientists, myself included, would say that this is basically, if there's any such thing as a best model of democracy, this is pretty much it. Um, PR parliamentary, um, You'll get some mix of opinions on whether federalism is good or not, but uh, most people would say a country as small as Israel doesn't really need federalism. So, you know, it, this this is a good model. Several successful long-term long-term democracies fit this general model. I would say Denmark, Sweden, Norway, New Zealand. Several others come close. They might have a weak upper house, or they might have a weak president who's elected rather than appointed. Uh, elected by the people rather than elected by the legislature, like Israel's is. Um, I would there are examples of Portugal, Finland. Um, there are federal parliamentary cases like Canada, Australia, and Germany that are not that different from this model. So again, it's not you know nothing unusual about this. Moreover, all democracies have supreme courts or something similar. Some of them have a separate body called the constitutional court. Sometimes those are combined, as they are in Israel and the U.S., constitutional and regular courts being in one, the apex being at one Supreme Court. <clears throat> but not all democracies empower their courts to overturn legislation. So some of the, like the defenders of the, the judicial overhaul say, well, you know, this wouldn't be that unusual if we, if we told the court that it can't overturn legislative acts, because there are plenty of democracies where that's the case. And that is true. That is a true statement. For example, in the Netherlands, there's no um, there's there's no judicial review on constitutional matters. They can't overturn legislation. In Switzerland, there's not, although Switzerland has all sorts of other minority protection devices built into its system. So well, so Israel fits a like what many of us would call a normatively desirable and empirically successful model of democracy. And it still would. This is something I want to say that that I think gets lost too often. It would still fit this model, even if the court couldn't claim that there's a higher law than this piece, of, any given piece of legislation that the Knesset has passed. It would still conform to that like, good model of democracy. Um, but it's highly anomalous in various other ways, and that's where we get to the interesting things and the things that have provoked such justified, in my view, concern that led to these huge protests. What is the Constitution of Israel? That sounds like a trick question. Shouldn't, shouldn't I be able to just like pull it off the shelf and open it up and there's the Constitution and I see the powers of all the different aspects of government and the, and the rights of the citizens and all the things that constitutions normally cover? Um, well, no. The Constitution of Israel is whatever a majority of the Knesset says. 
there's no single document called the Constitution. I'm sure everybody knows this. If you didn't know it before the recent protests, you certainly know it now because this has been mentioned so many times. Uh, there's no document that's ever been enacted by the Knesset or a, or a constitutional convention or something like that that stipulates that it is higher law than just a regular statute passed by the legislature. There's no such document. <clears throat> A related anomaly that's absolutely central to these events is that the Supreme Court itself declared in the 1990s that it had the authority to overturn legislation on the grounds that the Knesset had passed a set of other laws that they called basic laws and that those were the Constitution. And so therefore, if the Knesset has passed a law and we, the Supreme Court, a majority of the Supreme Court, decide that it contradicts the basic law, we can invalidate that legislation. That's, that's, never, that's not in the basic law, that the, the, the basic law in the judiciary. It doesn't say the, that the judiciary can do this. The judiciary asserted in the mid-1990s in a series of cases when Aharon Barak was the president of the Supreme Court, the chief justice, that because there are basic laws, it must be that we have the authority to interpret what contradicts them. So in effect, the Supreme Court declared that Israel had a constitution and that it was the guardian of it. So I wanna say that the political right in Israel has a point when it says that the court has usurped legislative sovereignty in a way that it had no authority to do. People on the right will use the, the phrase, we vote right, we get left. It's a common criticism. They claim that, so since 1977, most elections, a few exceptions, but most elections have returned a right-wing majority. But the court has periodically invalidated legislation passed by those governments, and of course, the right says, well, look, we're still getting left-wing policy. That is, the court is upholding a status quo or, or that, that the, the legislative majority is trying to change or the legislative majority is enacting legislation that the court says violates a basic law. So, I mean, they have a point. Of course, it's one thing to have a point and it's another thing to take a kind of blunderbuss approach that they're taking. And that's what I, I that's, you know, I, I'm just trying to set the parameters here. I want to, if if I'm allowed, yeah, I'm allowed. Okay, I'm going to quickly. Uh, I've only got a couple of slides that that I think will help with a few specific points. So, um, whoops, that's not the one I wanted to show. I'm trying to show you that one. Um, the the basic law in the judiciary establishes an appointment process, an appointment commission, judicial selection committee that consists of nine members. This is how members of the, of, the, of the Supreme Court and other courts are actually appointed in Israel. This commission, which if you look, if you read in, in, in B, it's there, what you get is there are three members, three of the members of this committee are members of the Supreme Court itself. Two are government, government ministers and two are other politicians from, from the legislature who could be from the coalition or, but often one is from the opposition and one is from the coalition. <clears throat> and two from the Bar Association. And two, although it's not clear from this excerpt that I gave you, the, to appoint a Supreme Court, Supreme Court justice requires seven of the nine to consent. So the right has made several disingenuous claims about the procedure implying that the court basically perpetuates itself. I've heard that over and over. We have a self-perpetuating court. The court decides who's on the court and therefore we, 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 we can never have a court that respects the democratic will of the citizens, which they would say is us, right? We're in the, we're in the majority. We've got a right-wing government. We're the majority. The court doesn't respect that. It just perpetuates itself. It's disingenuous, especially when they go so far as to say, um, judicial dictatorship um any i mean the I'm, I'm trying to close this and my cursor doesn't seem to be finding it there we go uh no there we go okay uh so um 
they say the judiciary has a veto on appointments, which might be technically true if you work through it like, how do you get seven votes? You're going to have to include some of the Supreme Court members as well. But, but the point is, you also have to include politicians. They both have a veto. So it, it's a process that encourages a consensus. I'm going to say that I would love to take this model and import it, a model that, that allows professional judges and politicians to jointly decide who's on the court rather than just letting politicians do it. But the Israeli right is trying to make it so that the politicians, not just any politicians, but the government selected members will have a majority. The right says that numerous other democracies give the legislature or the cabinet the final say on, about who sits on the court. Um, it's actually only kind of like technically true. In fact, I think the vast majority of democracies involve their judiciary some way in appointing who sits on the judiciary. Why would they do that? Even if it's sort of like not written in law somewhere, they do it in practice. Canada, Germany, New Zealand, um, Australia, a, lot, a whole host of Japan, a whole host of democracies uh, have judicial councils or judicial selection committees on which judges themselves are the, are the dominant factor. And the legislature just ratifies the selection proposed by this commission or this judicial council, it's sometimes called. Um, so actually what Israel has currently is more politicized than what many other parliamentary systems have because in most democracies, the US is not one of these cases, right? But in most democracies, politicians have recognized that they should restrain themselves for who goes on the court. They shouldn't appoint their people. They should have professional judges. And who's better to determine who's qualified than other judges? So the right is making, in Israel, is making it sound like this is just like some crazy idea that Israel has had all these years and that it shouldn't ever be allowed in a democracy. Eh, kind of not really right. Um, so if this passed, would this be the end of democracy? So here I'm going to, I've been kind of, you know, pushing back against the right. I'm going to push back against the, 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 the left and the center left a little bit. No, it wouldn't. Uh, I don't think so. And here's the reason why. The normative argument I mentioned earlier um, that many political scientists, including myself, hold that coalition-based parliamentary democracies, those parliamentary democracies where you elect the legislature by proportional representation, meaning it's unlikely that any one party has a majority and they have to build coalitions, that that's actually the best protection for minorities that you can get. Here's the, here's the, 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 the like one sentence version of the logic. Coalitions shift over time. So you, if you have the, like the, a fluid system with lots of parties coming and going in the system and vote shifts over time and, and disputes that cause parties in coalition to break apart and find other allies, that's what protects uh, against tyranny of the majority, is that the majority itself shifts not from like just one party to another party, because then you can be like one tyranny and then another tyranny, but it shifts from one set of parties to another set of parties, which may include some of the ones in the first set, and then it shifts again to another set. And that's, in fact, the way Israeli politics has generally worked is one party might be dominant for a while. It used to be labor. Recently, it's been Likud, but the partners shift regularly. And so having a majority choose the court is not the same thing as, you know, it's, it's almost like the left really believes the right's argument that they'll never win an election again. And I, I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't really believe that. So I, 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 I'm going to try to wrap this up in the next seven minutes or so. I know, I, I know there's, there's, there's a, a you're, kicking. Matthew, you're, you're doing great. I can't believe how, <laughs> how well, you are so succinct. So, so just keep going. No, I've never thought of myself that way, but okay. Uh, thank you. I, I'm going to show the other slide, which you accidentally got a sneak preview of a moment ago because of uh, you know my not a, uh, inability to share a screen properly. I guess it's it's election results. It's a mess, and was kind of the point. 
Okay, so if you look at this, say that's a mess. Yeah, you got the point. Wait, so wait, wait. There's Matthew, really no we're, good. We're, we're still, there we go. There we go. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, what happened? Let's try that again. No, we can see it now. The 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 one with the yeah, uh, but it's uh, I, I'm sorry, but it's not supposed to be doing that. Let's see now. I think it'll automatically shift, and I hope it'll stay there. Okay, that was bizarre, but oh, it's probably on play. <laughs> it's it, so you, it's probably on play, and we have to pause it. Or maybe you're right. Maybe it's I think stay. it'll stay. Okay, great. I think it'll stay here now. I don't know. Anyway, um, it's really hard to present the Israeli parties and elections in any succinct way, and so here I just up four of the recent there have been six elections since 2015 five of those since april 2019 of course you all know that um and i any time you try to group these parties in blocks and in sectors it's really difficult but i tried to do it with color coding i put the center center left and left all in one color because I only have a limited palette of colors to work with, and there are so many different tendencies in the Israeli political system, which again is kind of the point. So if, if you look at the most recent election, the 2022 November, um, a really extraordinary thing here is that this government does not even rest on the majority of the voters. So we're hearing the right talk regularly about how it represents the will of the electorate, but there are two problems with that. First of all, they didn't campaign saying we're going to drastically overhaul the judicial system. Yeah, lots of politicians in the right have talked about this for years and years. They didn't run on saying this is what we're elect us and this is what we'll do. For logical reasons, they didn't really want to talk about that too much because it would remind people, if you talk about the judiciary, it's, ever, it's always going to remind people of Netanyahu's legal problems. So they didn't really talk about it much during the campaign. Um, but more than that, they didn't even get a majority of the votes. The parties in government have less than half the votes representing them. Uh, that's extremely unusual in a PR, proportional representation, parliamentary democracy, right? Proportional representation, by definition, should represent everybody proportionally. And yet here you have government with 64 of the 120 seats, but only 49, 49.5, and that includes that shockhead party which I put in red up there, which didn't get any seats at all. So we could say their votes, you know, that's all right. They're already included in that. Um, and so um, the other thing that, that I'm really highlighting here, notice all the places where I put red are things that like you should really, really, really trying to call your attention to. In April, 2019, there was an election in which the center right got a majority of the votes, but only half the seats and couldn't form a government. The big thing that happened there was the right was split. The right did not present a, anything close to a coherent front. And the, Jew, the, uh, the new right party of Bennett and Shakhed, uh, Ayala Shakhed uh, and uh, um, Naftali Bennett, just missed the threshold, the threshold is 3.25%. They just missed it. So they wasted all those votes. And there's this other right-wing party, the Zehut, the, the Zehut party by a, by a defector from, uh, from Likud, which I, I'll sum up their platform as basically smoke dope and build the third temple now. It's a very interesting party. Um, I'm, I'm not making this up either. <laughs> uh, they also, they wasted some votes. Um, what happens in 2022? The left and the Arab sector waste votes. They split too much in too many different ways and merits falls below the threshold, just like the new right did in April, 2019. And one of the Arab parties, 2.9 falls a little bit below the threshold. So what we, what we look like kind of big shifts are sometimes the result of decisions taken by, by party leaders who thought they could make it over the threshold on their own and they decided to, to, to not unify with someone else and they, and they didn't get over. But consistent through most of these elections, the possible exception of 2019 early, that depends on how you code some of these, but the broader right has a majority without these extremists like Ben Gvir and Smotrich. 
because I'm counting Gantz as center right. Realistically, he's a center right figure. When he's in alliance with Lapid, okay, I can't count it that way because Lapid is certainly center left, center, whatever you want to call him. But he's not, he's not a right wing politician, but Gantz really is. Um, you can't run your first campaign inter introducing, I mean, everyone knew he was, he'd been chief of staff, but introducing yourself as a prime ministerial candidate, you run your first campaign showing the smoldering ruins of part of Gaza City and basically saying, I did this. You know, he was re running, claiming credit for how tough he was, right? You, you can't run like that and not be called a right-wing politician. So I'm calling him one. And you could build a majority from a set of center-right and right-wing parties that leaves out the ultranationalists like Smotrich and Ben Gavir. Why? That's, that's there. Why doesn't it happen? Because Bibi Netanyahu, right? I'm, I'm, I'm an institutionalist. I'm not supposed to say things can come down to individuals. But in this case, there's no question, right? Netanyahu has spent the last, all, all the way back to like 2018 under corruption investigation and, and on trial more recently and alienating allies from, from across the spectrum. He's kind of made himself a position where he has no other allies to turn to besides, of course, the Haredi, who are always his natural allies, and then Smotrich and Ben Gvir, who jointly got not even 11% of the vote, but arguably have a lot more than, you know, that certainly have really important positions in this government and, and have really, really radical um, Radical isn't even the word, but just extremist positions. I don't think that really is a stable thing. I don't think that is going to, I don't think they're going to build on that and do better in future elections. I think there's still a place for a moderate right, which, or a, I, I, moderate's the wrong word. People like Smotrich and Ben Gavir and other politicians that I won't name have kind of made us think that anyone who's not a raving extremist is a moderate. I wouldn't call Shockhead and Bennett moderates. They're not like tear down everything kinds of <laughs> right wingers. That portion of the electorate that was represented by Bennett and Shockhead just missed that threshold in April 2019. It would have been a very different past for years in Israel if they had cleared it. They then went into government the stars in the table show the governments. And so, you know, Bennett went into that government with left wing and an Arab party. He killed his party by doing that, sadly. I mean, I think he did a pretty heroic thing, heroic thing there to form a government that was a broad, uh, you know, spectrum without Netanyahu. But he killed his party. He retired from politics, at least temporarily. And Shaka had got 1.2% of the vote trying to carry on the party. Um, Voters who wanted a right-wing option to the right of Likud had nowhere else to go. Well, even if whether they liked Smotrich or Ben Gavir, that was the that was the option available to them. So anyway, I'm trying to end on a somewhat optimistic note, but I'm not quite coming out that way. But the point being that there's a there's clearly a majority that would be center right, center center right, whatever you'd want to call it, without the extreme right. And I believe it would reassert itself if Netanyahu were either to be exonerated or convicted or somehow resign. Um, but we're, we're it, the Israeli political system is right now just in a difficult state where it's stuck with Netanyahu. <laughs> and it's therefore stuck with Smotrich and Ben Gavir. And these folks all have this agenda where they think that the court has been left wing all these years and now is our one time to change it. Um, I think maybe I'll stop my statements there and let, let people ask questions because <laughs> um, I've said a lot um, and I've probably confused everybody because I'm I, good at that. You know, Matthew, why don't you go ahead and stop sharing your screen, even though that, yeah. I, I, like, I, I, I'm so glad that I've sort of memorized that. If people have oh, problems, yeah, right. what, I, what I'd like to try, and I know that there's no perfect way to have a Zoom meeting with 77 people, but just because it's such an emotional topic, let's try a moderated system where people put questions in the chat, and I also pick um, 
a, a few of them to highlight. And of course, Matthew, depending on how agile you are with all of this, you, you can choose. I'm, I'm going to start off with um, two questions I've, I've written down, but I'm also going to go, I see alone just pop something in there and I'm going to check that out too. But, you know, so Matthew, you said that uh, coalitions can shift, you know, and, and it made yeah. me feel better. I mean, you're alleviating some of the, 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 the strain of what we're watching. So you're like, look, you know, in, in a democracy, coalitions can shift very quickly. And if the power is given to the majority, then that majority can change. So my question is, then what does the present coalition think they are accomplishing by making this? I mean, is it just revenge for, you know, putting Netanyahu on trial? Or, or do they, you know, is there some kind of, is there a long-term reform? Is there a long-term benefit to this reform that they see? And I'm just going to throw out another question, you know, at the same time, which is, um, whether, uh, ha, you know, there was a part of me that was wondering whether Israeli demographics have been coming home to roost, meaning that 20 years ago when people like I and many others lived in Israel, sometimes for years at a time, you know, we, we watched people in Tel Aviv have 1.5 children and we watched uh, settlers and Haredim have 12 to 15. And we knew that someday that was going to have an impact on coalitions and electorates. Is it, or do you see, because when you said this, you know, the Smotrich, they got less than 11%. I mean, it's, it, it's not like, um, you know, it's, it, it's not like 55% of the country is supporting this. Um, so I was wondering whether there is a demographic shift or whether uh, that, that's not so salient. So the, what, are the, what do they think they're accomplishing and um, how much demographics, and, and in a sense, the, the winds of history play a part in this. Yeah. So those are both really great questions. So <clears throat> the the first one just kind of nails it. Like, if sixty one votes can tell the decide that the government gets to appoint the court and that the court and the and, and gets to override the court, sixty one votes could take that back. Um, they're 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 not they're not they're not searching for consensus here because they know they could never get a consensus on something this drastic they could get consensus on something that would tweak the process somewhat but they don't want to tweak the process they, they yeah they want they 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 want to reclaim power but they're but the point is they can't reclaim power because they have to they have to keep winning elections but if an elect, I, I, I've seen the, the polling that's come out just this week since since Netanyahu fired the defense minister and that provoked these even bigger demonstrations, calls for general strikes and so on. And finally, he said, OK, we'll pause, whatever that means. Um, Likud is now currently polling at only 25 seats. They got 32 in the last election. That's a huge shift in Israeli public opinion. And and uh, Gantz's party is polling at like 22 or 23, and Lapid's is polling at 22 or 23. So if a if an election were called now, of course there won't be one. But if there were an election now, Likud would probably find itself out, not probably find itself out of power. There'd be a majority around Gantz, Lapid, the left parties. And you, you might not even need the Ram party from the from the Arab sector that was in Bennett and, and uh, Lapid's previous government, but Maybe you would, but I mean, you know, that's okay. That would be a good thing. Well, okay, normative point. That would be a good thing. Uh, it was a good thing when it happened. It would be a good thing if it happened again, but it may not even be necessary. So, the, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the right has played a really bad hand here, and I don't completely understand it, except they've wanted to do, certain sectors of it have wanted to do this for a long time. They seem to think this is their moment. And I'm saying that I don't think it is their moment. I somehow this is going to fail. They'll pass it, but it won't last. It'll get overturned or they will fail to pass it. My guess is the main reason Netanyahu paused it was he no longer had the votes. I think uh, the, the key was always, would there be members of Likud who would go to him and say, we're not going to vote for this? I'm sure my guess is that's what happened. He was willing to, to face down a general strike, I'm pretty sure. He was willing to, you know, do whatever it would take if he had the votes. I'm guessing he just didn't have the votes anymore. Once Gallant made his I'm going to say very sincere and very heroic statement. Um, I think Likud probably couldn't deliver the votes anymore. Um, so the, the demographic, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, over a long period of time, that's exactly what's happening, right? The, the, the Haredi sector is growing. The, the Mizrahi, which tends to vote for the right, is growing. Um, but then we still see these short-term shifts in election results, like where 
the religious Zionists go from 5% in one election to 11% in the other. Why is that? It's because the less extreme right, but still right of Likud, in other words, Bennett and Shaki had disappeared, you know, in one election, basically punishing them for going into a, into a coalition with the left. So what's, you know, making long-term projections is always extremely dangerous. I mean, yeah, the, the Haredi sector is certainly going to get bigger. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not really answering your question, but no, the no, no, demographics no. Are, are a huge part of this. I mean, they're a very huge part of it because almost everybody in Israel, this is a you know, huge, I'm, I'm, I'm over, over generalizing, but most voters in Israel vote with the group they belong to rather than just like, well, what party do I think has the nice platform? They don't vote, they don't vote. Most people don't vote that way. They vote What's the party that represents my community? So if the community shift in size over time, that has profound Im impact on the political outcomes. So I'm going to pick up on that. I, I just think people are so um, articulate in the chat area. I don't need to read them unless it helps you. Oh. But but no, no. But I'm happy to read them because they're really easy to read. I, I don't have to okay. summarize okay. that. Okay. But, but two people, okay. I'm going to go more or less in order, but two people have mentioned picking up on the demographic issue, Mizrahi Sephardi versus Ashkenazim, that the you know, Supreme Court has been maybe, ex uh, not Supreme Court, pardon me, the, the, you know, of the justices, they've been maybe almost exclusively Ashkenazic, and that there's an, you know, when you said that people vote how, you know, how they, you know, it's, I'm talking about settlers and Haredim, but there's a, there's another ethnic identity issue going on here. I was wondering if you um, could comment on how, how that's playing a role here. I, um, I have, I did look at the current roster of Supreme Court justices, and I mean, they're, I mean, there, there's there's one Arab member. There are two or three. There are 15 total. There are maybe two or three who are who are almost certainly Mizrahi. There might be others who are. You know, I mean, you know, I'm making generalizations that can't, from bios and pictures. And you know, I mean, that's really bad bad practice. Uh, but um, some some of them say some, you know talk about organizations they were involved with, which gives cues to you know what what their identity might be. So I mean, there's certainly an Ashkenazi majority, and and uh, uh, you know the 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 establishment, the, the judicial establishment, is more favorable to. I mean, this is this is a common refrain. It's not me saying it, but it's you know it's on balance more favorable to an Ashkenazi sort of worldview, um, and so you know I mean again the the right kind of has the right which is more likely to, is the part of the political spectrum that the Mizrahi are more likely to vote for. The right has a has a point that the court could be more representative. I think that's probably true. Thanks. And do you get that with their reforms? Maybe, but they're also going to clearly impose an ideological litmus test. So, so my ne the next question comes um, from Mark Daskin, but actually it was very much on my <laughs> mind, which is uh, about the protesters. You know, like what is, you know, in my shorthand, it would be what do the protesters think they're protesting? Is it judicial reform? Is it anti BB? Yeah. Like, what is it? And I think Mark said it well. So he said, You have focused on the court, but many commentators have suggested that the current protests are really about the heart of Israel, how it treats the ultra Orthodox, how it treats Israeli Arabs, Palestinians, academics. Can you comment yeah. on this? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, um, I knew somehow that would come up in the Q&A, so I decided to postpone it for now. Um, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I'd love to think as a political scientist that people really get agitated by, by things like what's the structure of the Judicial Selection Committee and what's the number of votes needed to override. And, you know, I mean, because I get pretty excited about stuff like that, but you don't get hundreds of thousands of people on the streets over stuff like that, right? It's It's all about policy and power all the way down, right? I mean, that's what people are concerned about. And yes, why is why do the parties on the right and why do the Haredi parties want these changes in the judicial system? It's because they don't trust, well, for the Haredi, the obvious answer I think is they, they want an override clause because they think even if there were more conservative justices, they wouldn't be their kind of conservative. They wouldn't be they wouldn't be sympathetic to a Haredi worldview. They want to be able to say, look, we're in the coalition and we can tell you we're bringing down the government. 
if you don't ensure that we can maintain gender segregation at, at municipal sponsored events that that you know in you know in our towns um in other words with public support or uh you know not going to let us pass a law so we can prevent chametz from being brought into the hospitals during pesach i mean right courts will the, the court they they can't trust they can't trust secular courts so they want they but they can trust the coalition government that they are pivotal to and so if you're in the secular whether that's a majority or not, I mean, you know, it depends on how you define the things and how people self-define. But if you're in the large block of a country that is secular, or even those who might be religious but not Haredi, you know, um, you, uh, you know, you, 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 it's easy to see why people might think that this is just a stepping stone towards giving the Haredi even more control over society than they already are perceived to have. So yeah, it's about can, much bigger issues. Can I ask you just, I'm, I'm quoting several, uh, Rebecca Kanner and Beth Waskin among others in the chat, which is that, okay, if the Hari, and if I, if I misunderstand you, which I probably do, you can always tell me. If the Hari Deem are like, look, we're, we're one or two issue, you know, like it wouldn't matter if you gave us everything if tomorrow that you let Hamid's in the hospital, you know, and I, so, but yeah. how about, how about the people who are, are there to sit, are there decisions being made by the Supreme Court that this reform was a statement about? Either decisions about settlements, or decisions about the occupation, um, or, or the, or you know, it's really the same thing. Or decisions about LGBTQ. Are there decisions being made yeah. that even if all of this is reversed by the next majority, that they're making a statement about, and that uh, some of us might be missing? Yeah, I think. Uh... Well, especially for the Haredi, uh, it's it's the whole. There's a whole set of decisions that have been based on the the basic law on human dignity is is the name of it. it was passed in 1992, I think, <clears throat> and it it doesn't have the word equality in it, but it says that no law can infringe the the dignity of the person and the privacy of the person, and so the court has used that to say, well, then that. That means that you can't have gender segregation in publicly funded events. I mean, you can do, you know, privately you can do it, but but publicly funded funded events you can't do it. The Supreme Court has, of course, invalidated uh, several attempts to grant a formalized exemption from IDF service to the to Haredi. I mean, it's you know informally that's been done for a long time, but they say you can't inf you can't put that in law because it violates equality. So I mean, there are a whole host of decisions there that they could point to. Yes, some of the some of the um, early time or early examples of saying we need to have a, a, an ability to override the the court has been about decisions regarding Palestinian lands, uh, building of settlements on on land that where Palestinians had title. The court, I mean the the legisl the the government <laughs> let's get the right institution here the government often will will declare something uh state land and therefore if it's an area c under the oslo agreements you can build on it uh the courts have sometimes looked at those looked at some cases and said no 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 that's actually private land you can't build on it well if you can override you can you can then say that, you know the the court has decided incorrectly here, and we can go ahead. So yeah, there are there are, it, it's tied up in all the big issues of religion and state and uh, uh, relations with Palestinians. Well, that, you know, I mean it's, it's 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 very much at the core of of why they care about this. Actually, it's a very helpful answer because in other words, some of the things I've been reading in chat is like even if long term this is overturned, I mean if if they can be like no, now we can build a settlement or now we can annex this land. I mean, then you've got facts on the ground that even if court, even if some structure is changed in the future, um, short-term games could be very specific, could be very um, significant. Um, both Beth Waskin and Rob Mickey and uh, maybe others, as I've been, because I've been listening even more than I've been reading, have said, look, often these kinds of things, these kinds of reforms actually are meant to politically lock in 
favor for your party going forward. And we've seen that in democracies. Actually, I shouldn't say this. I, I, I think I've seen this in democracies that have become, at least by perception, less democratic, right? There are these little reforms, but what they really do is lock people into power. Is there any aspect to that in this case um, that you can discern, you know, you know providing favoritism well, for the present coalition going forward? <clears throat> Well, I mean, the, the point about the facts on the ground is, of course, a, a good one. I mean, that's it's a lot harder to make a ruling that a you know a bunch of apartment buildings have to be torn down than it is to say they can't be built in the first place. So that that's that's a very important point. Um, but uh, but otherwise, uh, in general, no, because any any sixty one vote majority could reverse or amend what what they're passing here. I mean, this is the they could if they could get seventy votes to change the basic law in the judiciary, they could write into that that future changes require 70 votes. And that there are some basic laws that have clauses like that, but 61 votes are not going to be allowed to bind 70 votes. I mean, I mean, I, mean, I guess they could try it, but I mean, I don't think it would hold. I think a future majority would say that majority can't bind us. And I think they'd be right. In the absence of a constitution, it's pretty hard to lock stuff in. Could Again, they raise... aside from things that involve literally building. Could they raise no, the three ahead. and a half, could could they raise the three and a half percent threshold? Because you pointed out that, I mean, at least in this election, that that really did a lot of the liberal parties in. Yeah, well, it did in uh, well, one merits. liberal party merits, and, and then one Arab party, which is the Balad is definitely not liberal. But, but sorry, an, so, an so actually, I my and, it, and it did in and it did in the right, the new the so called new right in in April two thousand nineteen. Um, they should lower it. I mean, that's what I would say. The threshold's too high. I know it sounds low, but it's actually too high. But yeah, they, it could be raised. Um, yeah, it could be. It, it, it's been raised before by a narrow majority. The in in 2015, the it was still uh, or before 2015, rather, it was still two percent, and it was raised to try to keep the Arab parties out, which that's why they formed the joint list, and then they got. 10.5% of the vote and cleared together. <clears throat> so, so I'll yes. ask, so, so if I'm not interrupting, I'm going to ask, I think, one more question, um, at, which is uh, this from Leah Kalani, um, which is, says, do you think Israel is heading in the direction of theocracy? And can I, as the rabbi, just tack on to that? Um, uh, a little, <laughs> of course which, you can. <laughs> well, no, I mean, yeah, who's going to say no? So um, it, it, like, I'm going to show my ignorance here, which is just... I, in my own personal life, um, I had so many friends in California who were uh, Persian or Iranian, and I just I didn't understand how so much of Iran is liberal and modern, and yet uh, reli you know fundamentalist religion has such power. And so I was wondering, um, and you know I've seen this a little bit. Like I lived in Indonesia, you know I think the fourth largest country in the world which you know, had a very moderate form of Islam, but I watched fundamentalist Islam gain more and more political power. So I was wondering, do you see any direct, but building on what Leia said, do you think Israel's heading in the direction of a theocracy, just taking that down one notch, is, is Israel, had, are there other examples in the world from your comparative view that like we end up with very democratic modern people, but with an outsized influence of very theocratically oriented um, it, 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 I don't know what to say. Influence? Um, I had, can't think of a good case. I mean, obviously the Iranian case, is, yeah, Rob Mickey says the Southern United States. Okay, I'll, I'll defer to him on that because he's an expert on that. Um, yeah, I was actually going to say the U.S. is probably in, in, in the closest parallel in a lot of respects because even though we don't have religious parties, um, because we have a, we don't have a system that encourages multiple parties, religious of a particular type of religious voter is central to one of the parties. It can't win a majority without them. Um, it can't win a majority in the electorate. It can't win the presidency without them. Um, so that gives them outsized influence. Um, but there's no, nothing I guess special I about the political structure of Israel that's heading in that direction. I don't think so. In fact, I, I, you know, I will still come back to my my bottom line point is that the model of proportional representation and parliamentarism guards against the that in a way that if they had a if they had a majoritarian system that is, you know, they, if they had two big parties, 
one of them would be dominant all the time, and that would be the party of the right, which would rely on Haredi votes. And I think they would have even more influence than they have in the coalition system. To, to defend that point would take me a lot more than the few minutes that we've got left. But I mean, I, I'm pretty much convinced that uh, I mean, the Haredi parties have twice in the last 10 years, a little over 10 years, uh, found themselves in the opposition because their demands were too big. And, and all it took was a small vote shift for, for a, a different coalition to be formed that left them out. And they've discovered they don't like being in the opposition. So, I mean, yeah, they have a few bottom line issues, but they don't push that hard on anything else. And I think if you really meant theocracy, it would be like, you'd have to turn everything over to them. Like you'd have to con to, to consult Litzman, you know, the uh, leader of the, one of the leaders of the UTJ uh, Haredi party, you'd have to consult, you know, Derry on everything, or, you know, the council of sages would, 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 it would be the equivalent, I guess, to the guardian council in, in Iran. And I mean, how would that come about? I mean, it's, just, it's, it's not something I worry about. I realize I don't live in Israel and I have the luxury of saying this as an analyst and I know people who worry about this, but I don't think so. I mean, you know, it's not Iran, um, a dictatorship that was overthrown by, uh, by uh, uh, a movement that was centered on, or yeah, I mean, the, the, the best organized part of the opposition to the Shah was, was the, centered on the, a particular religious uh, set of organizations. But, you know, no, I'm, that's not my big worry. <laughs> I'm, maybe I'm just too optimistic. <laughs> no, that's what we needed tonight. I, 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 so for, you know, like, I, I really, I want to thank you. I mean, I, I couldn't have asked, you, you've done exactly what I asked you to do, which is I wanted Thanks. to, I mean, I know that a lot of us have very strong emotions about what's happening. And, and it could be that democracy is burning in Israel. We don't know. But what I wanted was more context and more clarification about how Israel works, how it compares to other democratic systems, and to understand a little bit more about the details of what's going on, because, um, you know, I'm, I'm able to have moral outrage all on my own, but um, I'm not always able to have someone like you explain some of the, 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 the details to me. Um, and I know that there are people here on who know things that, that we didn't say. I mean, there's a lot of expertise within the congregation and within this community. So Matthew, I would well, really, I'd yeah. like to thank you. And I'm, I know you have more to give yeah. and more to say, but I just want to <laughs> thank you. I, I mean, uh, uh, to, to, to accept my call is also a big deal because I don't think it's easy to talk about uh, these topics. Um, we have, and, and you were very good at saying, you know, okay, I'm being a little bit more normative here, but I also want to, you know, be more balanced here. So I want to thank you so much.